Hello and welcome to Being Well, I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. So, Dad, how are you doing today? Super, and I'm very much looking forward to our guest. Very much the same. Uh, today we are joined by someone that I've really been looking forward to talking with. He's a renowned family therapist and an expert in male psychology and trauma, Terry Real. Terry is a clinician and author who focuses on helping people learn how to create the relationships they desire. He developed the Relational Life Therapy Framework, founded the Relational Life Institute, and over the years has trained thousands of mental health professionals in those approaches. He's the author of the classic bestseller, I Don't Want to Talk About It, Overcoming the Secret Legacy of Male Depression, and his most recent book, which comes out on June 7th, is Us, Getting Past You and Me to Build a More Loving Relationship. So Terry, we've, as we said, have been really looking forward to talking about this. Uh, we got the opportunity to talk a little bit before we started today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Forrest. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here with the two of you. And let me just say, as a specialist in male psychology, it's beautiful to see a father and son working together, and not just working <laughs> together, but by all appearances, getting along. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. And uh, that was actually one of the reasons you you just named it here, why I was so interested in having you here today, because um, I think that my dad and I have such an unusual paradigm of relationship. It's definitely not what you typically see, I think, between... Uh, parents and children. And I just wanted to start, if you're comfortable talking about it, by asking you about your own history. I mean, there's a line you're very familiar with, research is me search. And it really feels like your experiences growing up inform so much of the work that you've shared with people over time. Yeah, it, it really has. The essence of my work, and I will talk about my own origins, my work in my own life has been about transformation. Uh, transforming the legacy, the cards that you were dealt, changing them such that you deal a different set of cards to the next generation. Uh, my dad, as I wrote about uh, the first book, I don't want to talk about it, is uh, about a third autobiographical about my own depression and my own violent, depressed father. You know, here's what I say. Uh, my father was an angry, uh, depressed, uh, violent man. Uh, I am the son of an angry, depressed, violent man. He was the son of an angry, depressed, violent man. Uh, I have two children now, 31, 34, two boys, and uh, they do not say that. And that is one of the great achievements of my lifetime. So I became a therapist. I tease and say I started my role as a family therapist about the age four, mm -hmm. uh, trying to regulate my out-of-control parents to stay alive. I got into therapy, I think, uh, literally to garner the skills I needed to have the conversation that I needed with my father so that I could understand him and not become him. And um, I haven't. Uh, and I think that the legacy of my own trauma and my caretaking for my dad, you know, Trauma is almost always boundaryless. By definition, there's an invasion of somebody's uh, boundaries and there's fusion. And uh, children wind up A, blaming themselves and B, having a, a, a hyper empathic connection to the perpetrator. Uh, I remember uh, very clearly uh, being quite young and as my father uh, would be raging, uh, even beating me at times, I felt sorry for him. Uh, my heart broke for him, even as a young boy. And uh, coming out of that glue, uh, that enmeshment, and not 
pursuing the legacy that was my default. That, that's that been my life's work. Mm. Well, I think it completely comes through in your writing and in your work. And you just named so many different things that I would love to talk with you about during this conversation. Like you, you put a, a stake in so many different <laughs> uh, countries there as you were kind of doing the description. One thing that really stood out to me, and I hope stood out to people who are listening as well, is when you talked about you started your therapeutic journey at the age of four, when you were learning how to regulate up to your parents. You had to acquire key skills by which you regulated their dysregulated impulses. And that's a feature that you often see in, in trauma cycles and in, in trauma patterns inside of families. And I think that that might be something that people listening to have their own personal experience with if they come from a dysfunctional family. So I'd love it if you just took a second to explain kind of how that works. You know, um, it goes back to good old Alice Miller, the drama of the gifted yeah, the child. Totally. Everybody knows the title, but people forget what the gift is. The gifted child, it's not that you're super brilliant. The gift uh, of a, a child who is raised in trauma uh, is the gift of high EQ, high emotional sensitivity, uh, because you need that social uh, uh, sensitivity uh, in order to do what you need to do to try and stabilize uh, these uh, giant, unstable people that you're completely dependent upon. Uh, and so it is a gift to be able to uh, to read that. It's a gift that women uh, have in our culture, more than men, uh, generally. Uh, and whenever I make these broad statements, we all know they're broad general statements, and there's lots of variations, so that's a given. But, and um, it was really Jean Baker Miller, uh, the great feminist psychologist, who said, you know, the gift of sensitivity that women are much praised for uh, is a gift shared by all marginalized people because you have to whether whether it's African Americans or Jews uh, or women or traumatized children, uh, you develop extraordinary sensitivity because uh, you're at the mercy of people uh, who uh, who you're in the power of, and so you learn to manage up. I learned to manage up at four or five years old. And um, I can do better as a therapist than I was able to do as a four-year-old, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Four <-year -old. laughs> well, I'm glad thankfully. to hear that, Terry. <laughs> One of the things that you mentioned pretty early on in the book that you're kind of speaking to here is this idea of an adaptive child or the adaptive child response, which is something that we kind of have inside of ourselves. And you contrast that with this idea of the wise adult. Yes. And I would love it if you could like use this as a gateway into talking about those. Yeah, well, I'm sure your dad has a lot to say about this because it's really rooted in neurobiology. Yeah, totally. What, what we know, uh, and Rick, I, I, I'm nervous uh, talking about the brain in front of an expert <laughs> like you, so feel free to correct me. But you know is that the autonomic nervous system scans the body Four times a second, am I safe, am I safe, am I safe, am I safe? And if the answer is, uh, yes, I feel safe, then we say seated in the prefrontal cortex, what I call the wise adult part of us, the part of us that is here and now thoughtful, able to make deliberate decisions, the adult part of us. If the answer is, no, I'm not safe, I'm in danger, what tends to light up are the subcortical parts of our nervous system, fight or flight, etc. Uh, and we move, we lose uh, that thoughtful adult, and we move into a trauma-saturated, triggered, automatic knee-jerk kind of response. And that knee-jerk response that you or Rick or I will move into will have everything to do with our history in childhood. You know, I once heard Gabor Mate say, when it comes to trauma, you don't usually see the wound, you see the scar tissue. And in relationships, and I am a relational, you know, therapist, 
Uh, what we see in relationships is rarely the wounded child, which is very young, the part of you that was on the receiving end of the wounded child parts of us just want to crawl up in someone's lap and cry for about a thousand years. And uh, the uh, uh, wise adult part of us is here and now and not saturated with trauma. Between these two is an older immature part of us that I call uh, the adaptive child part of us. I got that from Pia Melody, one of my great mentors. And the adaptive mm -hmm. child part of us is how you contorted yourself to become what Pia calls a kid's version of an adult, your, your an immature version of what an adult looks like based on whatever you had at hand uh, under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a saying, uh, show me the thumbprint and I'll tell you about the thumb. So, for example, I had a guy, I described him in the book. He was the master of evasion. You know, he's the kind of guy you say, oh, the sky is blue. You go, well, Akmar Marine, maybe, you know, but whatever <laughs> you gave him, he wasn't going to going to bite. And after about four rounds of this, I looked at him and I said, who tried to control you growing up? Now, it seems like mm -hmm. therapeutic genius, but it's very simple. If his adaptation is to evade, there's someone on the other end of that. It's always relational. The, the evasion is on my side of the seesaw. What was on the other side of that uh, seesaw? And, of course, he had a very controlling uh, father, and he learned to evade. Good for you. I, I, I teach my students to always be respectful of the exquisite intelligence of the adaptive child. But I have a saying, adaptive then, maladaptive now. The same guy who learned to evade, I think it's one of the first stories in the book, learned to evade his father, became a chronic liar and was on the brink of divorce uh, when he came to see me. So the very things that kept him sane and whole and alive as a kid were screwing up his uh, personal life as an adult. Yeah, I wonder if I could just build on that in two ways. And the neurobiology part, you you know, you you know very well and very deeply. First, it's poignant and touching and even heroic, isn't it, to imagine the little kid we all were, and many little kids right now in the world today, as we talk, who are struggling to make sense of their world and struggling to learn things themselves that they can use and struggling to help, to help their beloved parents who are also mistreating them. The complexity of that and 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 the mag you know, it's magnificent and poignant and sad and heroic and all the above. And it's sometimes common for people when they come into therapy, just as you say, the solution then has become the problem now. And they're kind of embarrassed about their way of being and walking around in a suit of armor today that's three sizes too small. And there's some shame about that somehow, like shame that, that they became this adaptive child, as it were. And yet it was necessary and even heroic and, and very touching and poignant to do that. So that's kind of my first offering. Beautiful, Rick. And you're, you're spot on. The, when people first learn about the adaptive child, and I think even in psychotherapy decades and decades ago, there was a lot of harsh language about it. You know, you want to excise your inner parents and kill them off and uh, all, all that kind of harsh talk. And um, and indeed, when people first learn about it, they're, they're often harsh. They want to control it, get rid of it. Uh, and I'll tell you, if people watching and listening to this podcast take only this one thing away, one of the qualities of the adaptive child part of us is that it's harsh. And one of the qualities of the uh, wise adult part of us is that it's not. And uh, one of the things I'd like our listeners to take away from today is this. That there's no redeeming value in harshness. None. There is nothing that harshness does that loving firmness doesn't do better. And so uh, when you learn about this immature part of you, don't fight it. 
Uh, don't try and get rid of it. Don't try and control it. Uh, put your, one of the things I say is when an inner child kicks up, well, you want to put them on your lap, put your arms around them, hear what they have to say, love them up, and take their sticky hands off the steering wheel. You want to <laughs> hear them, love them, and demote them. <laughs> love you, buddy. But, you know, quite literally, uh, and I say this to the people I work with all day long, while I, I want us to be kind uh, to those uh, immature parts of us, uh, I also don't want them running the show. That's that's the kind of two-step process. Love you. Want to hear from you. Heard you. Now get in the back seat. I'm driving the car. Yeah. No, I, I totally love that. And I think that, please give me your view on this, Terry, but my reading of your work is that much as the work of most people who work in mental health or therapy in particular, is that you're dealing with patterns of behavior. The patterns that emerge inside of our relationship, the patterning of our own behavior coming out of a disruptive childhood experience, whatever we learned we had to do in order to get by. And we get those patterns from a lot of different places. Sometimes we get them directly from our parents. Sometimes we get them from social conditioning. I know that a major war, a major part of your work with men and focused on masculinity are the patriarchal stories that we receive. And you were talking about harshness a second ago, and I think that that's a big part of it. The title of your book is Us. You know, that it itself is a pushback against me and you, as you say in the book, or really against I, the kind of central myth of rugged individualism that we have in our culture that is extremely masculine in its orientation. Of course, you know, there are ways in which women can certainly embody that myth as well, but it's really communicated to men. If you if you share your feelings, you're weak. And if you're weak, you're not going to get what you want. If you're vulnerable, you're weak. Somebody else is stronger. They're going to push you down, whatever it is. And it feels like the title itself is a rebuttal to that. And so I just wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to talk about that here. Yeah. Two things. One is the essence uh, us is in many ways a critique of the culture, the toxic culture of individualism and patriarchy. And they're fused. Uh, they go hand in hand. And the essential delusion of uh, individualism is the idea that we stand apart from nature. That's what it means to be an individual. That's the definition of the word individual, is you are distinct and apart from uh, everything else, from nature. Uh, and then the essential delusion of patriarchy is not only that you are uh, apart from nature, but you're above it and controlling it. It's, it's an essential power and control model. Whether the nature that you think you uh, should control uh, is your wife and kids uh, or some colleague at work or your body, I've got to lose that 10 pounds, or your mind, I've got to be more positive, or, 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 or. And the essence of us is remembrance of the whole, remembrance of the relationship. Um you're not above nature in control of it. You're a humble part of nature and you depend upon it. I'm not Lord and master. I am a, a humble component part. And when we bring this into the world of relationships, well, all the terms change. Our relationships are our biosphere. You're in it. You breathe it. And you can choose to indulge and pollute your biosphere over here uh, with temper and anger if you want. But you'll breathe in that pollution over here in your partner's withdrawal or resentment. There's no escaping it. You're in it. You're not above it. And once you realize that, everything changes. For example, the relational answer to the question who's right and who's wrong is who cares. It doesn't matter. That's linear thinking. That's the way we normally think. Uh, the real question is, how are you and I as a team going to work in a way that's going to work for both of us? And once you stop thinking linearly and individualistically, power over, and you trade that in for humility and the whole, uh, then all of the moves that you make uh, to try and make your life better and make your relationship work better change. They're all very different. Terry, for me as someone who 
I would say, has kind of a Buddhisty frame uh, that really appreciates interdependence and dependent origination and inner being and all that. Um, also, as a personal corrective, it was valuable for me to read your book because, as, as Forrest knows, kind of rooted in my own childhood, uh, I'm really quite individualistic, autonomous, rebellious and prickly against external control. I had very well-intended but fault-finding and invasive and controlling parents. And so I learned my own versions of evasiveness uh, while maintaining a veneer of well-behaved, good student, you know, kind of persona. So in that larger context, uh, <clears throat> I've been thinking about the balance of acceptance and agency. Think about those two together and reflecting on your own background and my own too, and the ways in which many children, as they develop this adaptive child, have an exaggerated notion of their own power and their own capabilities, including to save their parents or influence their parents. And, and yet, alongside the poignancy of it all, it's kind of helpful for them to have that delusion of grandeur because the alternative is despair and annihilation and utter profound helplessness and defeat. So if you have to pick one or the other, it's actually adaptive to overestimate your efficacy, your agency as a kid, and you know keep on going there. So how do we balance, I guess, and bring together the value of accepting that we're part of a whole, the wholeness of it all, there's that dimension of acceptance there and seeing the whole, while at the same time claiming the power that we do have inside our own mind with what we think and what we say and, and how we listen to other people. The balance of those two seems really central to what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, it's, it's great, Rick. You know, my pal and colleague Carol Gilligan uh, has a wonderful phrase. She says, uh, there's no relationship without voice and there's no voice without relationship." And so it's both. And one of the things I say in the book is, look, I don't say there's no such thing as an individual. I say there's no such thing as an individual out of context, out of relational context. And so it's an I in the in a larger frame of we, and you respect that. The minute you lose that larger frame, uh, then it becomes a power struggle between two individuals. So, for example, I don't believe in altruism. I believe in enlightened self-interest. It's in my interest, for example, to um, uh, bring Belinda, when she's unhappy with me, into a happier state. I'm not doing this for her. Of course, I am, but not only for her. I'm doing it for me, too. Happy spouse, happy house. And once you start thinking ecologically that you're in the system, you make sacrifices, for example, to the larger whole, not to the other person. It stops being a zero-sum, win-lose game. And I think what that does is it reconfigures the whole paradigm of what power or agency is. Uh, Rianne Eisler speaks about power over versus power with. And I think power with is agency, uh, but power with is collaborative. My model uh, for all of this is art. It's the collaboration of art. The artist practices her craft, okay? She paints and paints and paints and paints. And then one day she's painting and inspiration passes through her and what lands up on the canvas is glorious. Uh, if you own what's on the canvas as yours, you're grandiose and egotistical. If you divest of the lar largeness that's on the canvas, you're playing games with yourself. It's not your power. It's the power that passed through you. It's a collaboration. And my model for agency and power is collaboration, whether we're talking about egalitarian marriages or we're talking about fair societies. Um, there, there really isn't an imbalance between me and we when we think of the me as embedded inside the we. Uh, mm -hmm. Then it's not me versus you. It's how are we together going to make this thing work in a way that's mm -hmm. going to nourish us both. It's a whole yeah. different ballgame. Yeah. There are 
are a number of things there that again i want to ask about so i'm picking one of them here um out of the whole constellation of of questions i could ask or topics we could explore one of them is just that practically one of the big problems that sometimes emerges between couples is there's an imbalance in their interest in moving toward us and away from you and i and the way that you talked about the enlightened self-interest aspect of it i have to imagine that that's probably something that you talk about in the room with people in terms of a good reason to move toward us while still allowing a person's defensive structure to exist a little bit in a sense of i if they're still kind of caught up in the selfing part of it but i'm just wondering how you work with couples when there is that imbalance when one of them is just more invested in an us orientation than the other one is I'm a great believer in education, and I think that uh, whoever is stuck in the old paradigm uh, can use some education. When I'm with a client, I don't get into a lot of abstract conversation for too long before I get practical. So it goes like this. Almost everybody who comes to see me, and I see couples on the brink of divorce. I see the you know really couples in extremis. Almost everybody who sees me is what I call an essentialist. What's wrong with my marriage is him or her, and what's wrong with him or her is their essential nature. They just are that person. Uh, and I give an example of that in the book, a true true story. A guy comes in and, you know, I ask him what his goal would be for therapy, and he says, I want to get laid. Uh, okay, uh, all right. You don't hear that every day, but uh, uh, good. I asked him what's wrong with his sex life with his wife. Uh, he was heterosexual. And uh, he says, you know, she's just cold. She's always been cold, cold, comes from a cold family. She just is cold. Now, there's a guy with no sense of us at all, right? Okay, this is where I come in. <laughs> this is my job. I bring in the wife and I say, what's with your sex life? And she goes, who would want to have sex with him? He's a terrible lover, won't deal with it. Every time I try and talk about my needs or his problems, he just gets mad and shuts me off. The hell with it. I bring back, we'll call him Harry. I'll bring back Harry, and I say to him, Harry, I've got great news for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a solvable problem, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have something to yeah, do with this. Totally. And so I rarely get into uh, abstract uh, sort of uh, conversations with people who are arguing with me. What, what I try and do is show them how thinking relationally, systemically will be useful to them. That I can help you achieve your goal. Let me, let me take another, may I take another example of this shift in thinking? So look. When faced with a partner uh, who is unhappy with us, uh, almost all of us uh, revert to uh, two orientations. Uh, the first is objective reality, which is a loser in personal relationships. So that's no place in personal relationships. So this is accurate. That's not accurate. That's half accurate. That's accurate, but you have to understand that, blah, 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 blah. That's going on. The second orientation is us. I can't believe I have to listen to this BS again, blah, 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 blah. So I'm sitting with Bill, and he goes to those two orientations, no us at all, all me and you. And I say to him, listen, I explain what the two orientations are. And I say, this is what I want you to try. Trade those in and replace it with this. And those listening, I want them to take this down. Compassionate curiosity about your partner's subjective experience. Compassionate curiosity. It's not about what's right or wrong. It's not about you. Put those things aside and enter into her experience. Honey, I'm sorry you feel bad. I don't want you to feel bad. I love you. Tell me what's going on. What could I do to help? That is losing the bullshit remembering the us and moving directly toward repair. Here, Harry, try it. And sure enough, I mean, if he tries it, you know, sometimes I'll be talking to Harry and I'll say this stuff and Mrs. Harry will be in tears in, in on the couch mm -hmm. next to him just hearing yeah. me describe this. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so I mean, that relationality is so absent from so right. many relationships, you know, just like the idea that your partner would would have the give a shit factor for your subjective experience is actually shockingly uncommon. It's shocking. It's shocking. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and it, 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 I am not a, uh-huh, uh-huh, tell me more about it therapist. I lead people by the hand and I teach them what this stuff actually looks like, how to actually mm. do it. And uh, when Harry uh, trades in his defensiveness and argumentativeness for a little compassion and curiosity, boom, the whole thing just opens up for the two of them. And he sees that. He gets that. Relationality works better for us uh, than the mores of our culture at large. And so that's our ace in the hole. We're born to be relational and connected. And when you teach somebody how to be more relational, it works better. And they can feel that. So, Terry, it'd be great if um, all the troubled marriages in America, and even some that are just kind of a little rocky, could have you hovering there in the, in the kitchen. They don't. What are some of the things that people can do on their own? Let's say in a classic setup, when I'm very familiar with, I'm sure you are too, where you have person A, person B, could be a heterosexual relationship, same gender. Um, and basically, person A would really wish that person B would start doing some things differently, including, let's say, listening with compassionate curiosity. That's kind of on the table. Often, I'm, my first book was about the long-term care and support of mothers embedded in their own relationships and pretty familiar with that territory you know when parents when partners become parents and very classically there's a breakdown of teamwork that tends to fall on gender lines in which the male partner is really not doing their share of housework child care and other kinds of things whether or not the mother is drawing a paycheck at the time just that's not even relevant to it so there are serious inequities there so you're in a situation where a is really asking for something from B, what do you think are some of the skillful ways within a relational frame that A could do that without having a couples counselor? Great. Uh, I generally say there are three phases to getting more of what you want. Uh, the first I call daring to rock the boat. Uh, this is getting their attention. And uh, that, that can be uh, fairly assertive. Look, pal. This is really important to me. I am overwhelmed with the housework, and I really need your help. I don't want to walk around in a state of resentment all the time, and this sucks for both of us. So I'm really going to ask you to please help out. Please, 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 this is important to me. So you have to stand up for yourself. And I want to double back on that, and, and I have some more to say about how to do that. The second phase is, once your partner is listening to you, once they, they're trying, help them. Don't uh, stand there with your arms folded and tap your foot and go, yeah, 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 yeah. But roll up your sleeves. and Okay, so uh, here's a list of the 43 things around the house that I do. Here are the three things you do. What would you like to take off my list and put on? You, th help them out. Work like a team. Uh, don't just sort of stand there and yell at them to do it better. Teach them what doing it better would look like. And then the third phase uh, is I call making it worth their while, which is uh, I, I teach people in general and women in particular to uh, celebrate the glass 15% full. <laughs> uh, it was only 10% full last week. And this is great. What do, what do we need to get it up to? 20. So often, when uh, partner B starts to try to please partner A, uh, what they get is cut off at the knees. You're not doing it right. The old homeostasis reasserts itself. You're not doing it right. Uh, too little, too late. You did it, but you did it wrong. And my personal favorite, Rick, uh, you're only doing this because I told you to. That's a real win for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm trying to please you. Shoot me. So these are the three phases. Be assertive and have voice. Make it clear that you mean business. 
when you do have their attention, break it down and teach them what uh, being right would look like for you. Put yourself at their service. You know, a great relational question is, what could I give you to help you give me what I'm asking for? How can I be at your service as you make these changes? Who does that? And then the third phase is, once they start to try, don't discourage, encourage. Uh, and th those are the three phases for how to try and get more of what you want. You don't need a therapist to do that. This is great, Terry, and I know Forrest wants to jump in. I just want to raise something that I suspect is in the minds of some people, at least, who are listening, and it's definitely been spoken out loud uh, in my own office, where the essentially, you know, it's the typical structure. I used to always want to have a symmetry of grievances, but no, they usually walk in the door, plaintiff, defendant, you know, and then after a while, the defendant starts talking about their own, you know, complaints about the, the plaintiff, but that's a bit down the road. So, okay. A wants something from B, and I hear everything you're saying is completely practical. I totally support it. And very often the person who really has been mistreated, reality does matter, obviously. They really have been let down, and they really very often are in a structure of patriarchy and privilege in which typically, classically, men are, I mean, women rather, are mistreated and let down by men. So Here's this person who's A, who's already beleaguered and let down and running on empty and fed up, who has to take her doofus, Fred Flintstone of a partner, by the hand and help him do the half of 15% of the right things he should have been doing for years. Ah! You know, you can see the emoji over her head of the you know, nuclear <laughs> the war mushroom, kind of emoji, the A-bomb yeah, mushroom, totally. kaboom. Okay, so setting it up, what could you offer to her, maybe in the frame of enlightened self-interest, of course, uh, that you know she could think about or be aware of uh, in, if she has a reaction like that? I support women, and I believe that in our patriarchal culture, not all, but a great many women have more relational appetite and more relational skill than we raise boys and men to, uh, to meet. And uh, what I would say to the woman is, I believe you. There is a relational asymmetry between you and your husband. Now, the question is, what do you want to do about that? I'm telling you, in a skilled, humble way, which I'll teach you, educate the son of a gun. Uh, help him step up. Teach him what stepping up looks like. Men and women both, but women are not exempt from this. The way we try and get more of what we want in our relationships, by and large, is we're passive. We wait until the other person fails, and then we complain about them. And that's about the worst behavioral modification program I've ever heard of. And so what I teach women is to be proactive and work up front to proactively go after what you want. And yes, it's unfair. Uh, it's really unfair. Uh, you shouldn't have to work this hard. And if you were married to you, you wouldn't have to, but unfortunately you're not. So let's deal with what's really on the ground here. And in the best of all possible worlds, uh, the man would come to the table and just know these things. But I, I, that's very tied into what I call the Cinderella myth. Uh, it, my perfect lover should just know what I want and, and deliver it for me. I, I, I like to say Cinderella is dead. Uh, Prince Charming probably just got out of rehab. <laughs> and if you want it, uh, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and fight for it. That's how it is in this world. Is it fair? No. Will it work and get you more of what you want? Yes. Choose your poison. It's not my life, it's yours. Uh, but if I were you, I'd rather work with the guy than yell at him for failing. Mm. So we're talking right now about some of the traditional patterns that you see, again, traditionally between men and women and heterosexual couples and I'm not an expert in this territory at all, but I have to imagine that there's some patterning that emerges in same-gendered couples or non-binary couples. And one of the things that I've heard you talk about in your work in the past, Terry, is how there's this classic kind of movement 
uh, which again is sort of a form of patriarchal patterning in our relationships, where men move toward being outwardly strong, individualistic, high-achieving, successful. And that this is contrasted with this inward shaming, where we don't feel like we've grabbed the brass ring, we haven't achieved everything we wanted to achieve in life, whatever. And then there's this movement for women, often, into outwardly accommodating, because they were taught to fit in and be pretty and be nice and not rock the boat and all of those things, and then a kind of inward resentment that builds inside of them because they've been taught to be accommodating and not rock the boat and all of these things. So these grievances pile up that f they feel like they can't effectively express. Um, both are really understandable. And obviously you put the two of them together and you got yourself a huge problem because you have this like outwardly strong dominant man who inwardly is filled with shame and this kind of like outwardly passive accommodating woman who just has the grievances pile up over time. I have to imagine this is a paradigm that's walked into your office like 10,000 times. Forrest, I call this, a, the, the couple you describe as America's power couple. <laughs> <laughs> a, an outwardly yeah. grandiose, successful man, inwardly haunted by shame, coupled with an outwardly accommodating, inwardly resentful woman. That's America's success yeah. couple. Uh, they will do very well in the world and hate each other's guts in, in the living room and bedroom. Mm. Yeah, those are the couples I treat. That's my beat. There's no kind of tidy way to ask this question because it's such a big question, but I'm wondering how you particularly, because a lot of your focus, again, men and masculinity is on working with guys with kind of unpatterning around this. When we say shame in this context, like what are we really talking about? What are the shameful experiences? And then how do you start helping people to work with those experiences? Well, first of all, I want to say something more about the women and Please, yeah. my, my counsel for women with these tough guys. What, what happens uh, with a lot of women, and I, I may get into a, a boatload of trouble with this, but a, a woman will eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it, and then one day the poor guy leaves the jar off the mayonnaise and 20 years' worth of resentment comes pouring out. Uh, when women do finally speak, often they're as harsh as men are. They shift from the quote-unquote feminine side of the equation to the masculine side of the equation, and uh, nobody can listen to them uh, when they finally do find their uh, voice. So one of the things I say is that moving uh, men and women and non-binary folks beyond into intimacy is synonymous with moving them out of patriarchy. But let me dive into that a little with women. When women move from the accommodating voiceless position to the Katie bar the door, I am woman, hear me roar, sort of, uh, you know, empowered position. I call it individual empowerment versus relational empowerment. They just shift from the feminine to the masculine in the traditional setup. It's what the family therapy would call first order change. It's a rearrangement of the furniture. I want to blow up the whole binary. And so under patriarchy, this is the point I make over and over again. Under patriarchy, you can either be connected or you can be powerful, but you can't be both at the same time. You can either be connected, affiliative, accommodating, quote-unquote feminine, or you can be uh, agentic, uh, 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 competent, uh, aggressive, quote-unquote masculine. But because power is power over, when you move into power, you break connection by definition. So let's redefine power. And what I am teaching uh, both disempowered men, but certainly women in my office, is what I call soft power or loving power. And loving power is a way of being fully a voice, standing up for yourself, and cherishing your partner and cherishing the relationship in the same breath. And I think it's brand new. I think it breaks the back of patriarchy. So it's the it's the difference between saying, Forrest, I don't like how you're talking to me. You, you know, talk differently or this is over. Uh, or saying, Forrest, I, I want to hear what you have to say. Could you tone it down so that I could listen to it? 
two different ways of saying the same thing. But one is standing up for my rights as an individual, and the other is standing up for us as a relationship. And you can be fully powerful and cherishing of the relationship in the same breath. And doing that moves us beyond individualism and patriarchy. It's brand new territory. I love you, honey. State your intention. I love you, honey. I want to be close to you. When you call me an F and B word, uh, that pushes me to the other side of the room. Could you apologize for that so I can feel close to you again? Who the hell talks like that? Only somebody who's been trained. But you can be fully empowered and loving and cherishing of the relationship all at the same time. Uh, we don't know how to do that in this culture. We have to be taught. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a huge psychoeducation aspect to it or a behavioral education aspect to it, it feels like, which is definitely central to what you've been talking about throughout this conversation, knowing better ways of engaging these different paradigms and patterns of behavior with other people. Um, I do want to ask you if you're open to talking about it, about that shame aspect of it, because I do think that for, yeah, just using myself as an example, why not? Like, I, I think that there, that we've internalized so many stories about what it means to be successful. And you're totally right that as we move more and more into a traditionally masculine architecture, a patriarchal structure, to be connected is to be vulnerable because you're dependent on something other than yourself. And I mean, it was totally the focus of your your first book, how depression can arise, that this depression that is tamped down out of this deep inner feeling of shame that can go that goes unexpressed in the culture. So you did a lot of very interesting work on rates of diagnosis uh, for men versus women with depression, which we know to be true. Like women are diagnosed at a much higher rate than men are still today. Um, but once you normalize for a variety of behavioral problems, all the rates become the same. So what we're seeing is that the behavior issue is just being acted out through a different vertical rather than through what we traditionally diagnose as depressive behavior. So that's a little inside baseball. But the roots of that are the shame that you're talking about. And um, so I, I would just love to to hear from you, like, what are those shame experiences that are so core for people? And then how do you start working with people around them? Our culture is built on unhealthy self-esteem. Yeah. Uh, I like to mm. say if uh, everybody in America moved into healthy self-esteem tomorrow, uh, our economy would collapse. <laughs> but don't worry about it because it's not going to happen. <laughs> but look, Pia taught me this. Uh, it, 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 healthy self-esteem comes from the inside out. It's a spiritual uh, a, a privilege. It's a birthright. Uh, and we understand this in principle as the bulwark of democracy. No, no one above, no one below. Uh, it, it's the principle of medical ethics. When when you talk to parents about kids, uh, if little Johnny is an ADHD nightmare and Sally is a concert pianist, and you say which one of those two do you love more, they they you know hitch in the head. It's irrelevant. It's it's not what you do. It's who you are. And our essential dignity and worth as human beings cannot be added to, it cannot be subtracted from. It, it, it is yours as a birthright because you're breathing. You cannot, in the book I call, it, and much of the book is about this, I call this the great lie. The lie that one human being could be superior or inferior to another, to say nothing of groups or races and all that extension. Anyway, men are universally haunted by shame. We, we are not taught healthy self-esteem, which is ours as a birthright from the inside out. We're taught that we have to earn our worth. I call this the Icarus myth, that we have to go out. We have to leave our families and our, uh, our partners and go off and prove that we're worthy of love. You know, I deal with guys who are working 80 hours, 90 hours a week to prove themselves worthy of love. Meanwhile, their wives and kids are sitting home going, where's dad? We're like, we miss him. Like, you don't have to earn anything. It's, it's craziness. But we uh, have three forms of uh, outside-in self-esteem that our culture runs on. The first, which is the biggest for men, is performance-based esteem. I have worth because of what I can do. I can close the sale. I can give my wife an orgasm. I can whatever, whatever, whatever. 
What uh, women often don't appreciate is how fragile that is. I mean, we talk about the fragile male ego, and I think that's what that means. You're only as good as your last game. There's always somebody warming up, ready to eat your lunch, and it is as uh, secure as, you know, a balloon in the wind. Performance-based esteem is what most men live off of. Uh, Attribute-based esteem is the other one you have worth because of what you have. Our whole economy is based on buy this Toyota and be a person of distinction, you know, uh, be special. And then the third one is other-based esteem. I have worth because you think I have worth, which is uh, a big one for women. These are all outside-in forms of um what uh, the great addiction specialist Ed Kansian used to call uh, our self-esteem prosthesis, our, our, our self-esteem dialysis machines, you know, uh, score, uh, score a good day on the stock market and feel good about yourself. None of that matters. And so I teach the uh, men and women and non-binary folks that I work with what healthy self-esteem looks like. The other way of describing it is that healthy self-esteem is being able to hold yourself warmly, tenderly, in the face of your human screw-ups and imperfections. And who in our culture emerges from our families with that? But you can learn it. You can learn to be forgiving of yourself, tender uh, of yourself, even when you screw up. It's a practice. Uh, that you can begin to use. You, you replace harshness, uh, with tenderness as you, uh, acknowledge you feel bad about your bad behavior, but you don't take yourself apart as a human being. These are all ways of combating the shame that we live with. And the other thing to say about men and shame is all men live under the patriarchal myth that we are above nature and we're in control. And it's a lie. And so all of us are huffing and puffing on the hamster wheel, trying to pretend that we're real men and that we're in control, when in fact it's a lie. I say running away from our human vulnerabilities is like trying to run away from your own rectum. Uh, It has a way of following you wherever you go. And so uh, shame is chronic for men because we're all trying to live up to some image which has nothing to do with who we are as human beings. This is all deeply profound. And I think about some of the Ellis Miller material that you're very familiar with about the manic defense against depression, the grandiose defense against shame, the ways in which very often what we present to the world is actually the opposite of what we feel or fear ourselves to be deep down. Uh, And one way to get at what people feel deep down or fear that they'll feel is to think about what essentially is the inverse of the act they're presenting to the world. Familiar notions for you. Um, I wanted to, if I could, kind of segue to a, a little bit of a different topic. We've been focusing here, I would say generally inside of a frame of romantic, semi-committed relationships and using that as a platform for engaging a lot of other topics. What about situations that are not so much about a romantic relationship? You're dealing with people at work, you're dealing with relatives, sometimes there are estrangements in family systems, these days increasingly over politics, as well as you know more traditional issues. What can a person do who, let's say, has sincerely really tried to work the us frame with another person and has been reasonably skillful on their own part to try to help things be better? Maybe it's divorced parents who are needing to co-parent children and their major differences of opinion. What can a person do when they finally get to, in effect, the end of the road where they've tried? They really have. They really have walked the we talk, they really have been reasonably honorable and effective in what they've done, and they're just dealing with someone who ain't going to budge. In fact, someone who, if anything, is going to attack and punish the, you know, the possibility of a us frame for the relationship. So do you have any suggestions for that kind of situation? 
you know, to be honest, this reminds me of when I when I open up to my students for case presentations and they always go to the most impossible case. And I say, yeah, that sounds impossible. <laughs> um, oh, I think it's a very, a very common, but if I could just it may be impossible, no, it is. but of you know, it is. hell is other people is. maybe as Sartre said, but uh, yeah. I think that, um, I think that you have to be realistic about the limits of your own mm-hmm. power. And uh, if you're trying to form a relationship with someone who uh, rides in the one-up, for example, and looks down their nose at you and just won't stop being contemptuous or whatever, um, if you're stuck with them, you try and make the best of it. Now, let's not talk about politics. Let's go antiquing. Uh, Half a loaf is better than none. So let's figure out how we're going to do that. But, um, you know, if it really is uh, impossible, you have to grieve. You have to let go. And uh, you have to say, you have to ask yourself what you're doing uh, there uh, at the end of the day. I wrote a piece for the Psychotherapy Networker uh, called Rowing to Nowhere When Enough is Enough. And it's about breaking up, whether it's a colleague at work or uh, and uh, I, uh, there's a tool that I give people. I call it a relational reckoning. And here's the, it, it's a question. And the question is this. Am I getting enough in this relationship to make grieving what I'm not getting worth my while? Am I getting enough to make grieving what I'm not getting okay with me? And if the answer is yes, you know, yeah, you're a, 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 a right wing, blah, blah, blah. And I'm a Massachusetts liberal. And, you know, uh, let's not talk about vaccines. Uh, but man, we can talk baseball and we love our kids and let's go out and have a beer. Uh, then I grieve what I'm not going to get from you and I embrace what I am. If the answer is no, it's not enough to make it worth my while, then you're done. And it's time to extricate yourself from the situation and take care of yourself. Uh, so there's a little tool to discriminate where you are in those circumstances. But don't ask me how to control the other person because the answer is damn if I know. The notion of unilateral virtue, you know, for that you do what's right for its own sake. And the notion of the kind of 80 20 rule that, you know, sure, exercise some kind of influence about trying to help your colleague at work or your brother-in-law or your spouse in various ways, but put the bulk of your attention, the other 80%, on how you yourself can be a more honorable, effective, responsible, decent, so forth kind of person. Yeah, I have a name for that. I call it relational integrity. And we all have to do that. Let's go back to personal relationships. Uh, it, 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 on Thursday at three o'clock, I'm in my uh, wise adult and you're in your adaptive child and I'm being really sweet and compassionate and you're being a total jerk. Um, what I teach people in that moment is what I call micro disappointment. The key in micro disappointment is keeping it micro and not escalating from there to he never, he always, he's such a. So there's a lot of that. And, and relational integrity is. If I behave well and you behave well, that's a great day for everybody. If I behave well and you're in your adaptive child and you're a four-star jerk and I don't jump in the mud pit with you, but I continue to hold on to my skill and integrity, that's not a good day for you. It's a mixed day for us. It's a great day for me. And so I agree with you. The focus is on my relational practice and how well I'm doing not the result. Yeah, Forrest and I have also have had the notion of shrinking or resizing a relationship to the scale that's actually in proportion to the underlying causes and conditions that, that make it healthy. And just like you said in your example, you, know, you can't talk about politics, but we can sure go deep about baseball. So in effect, you end up with imagining the initial scale scope of possibility of a relationship like a big circle and then things happen. Oh, can't talk about politics, going to carve that out. Oh, 
one date was enough for you. No more kissing. We're not going down that road. You know, you carve that out. And then a little later you learn, oh, never loan you money because I'm never going to get it back. You carve that out. You end up with something that looks a little bit like an amoeba. It's more like a blob. It's the blob theory of relationships. But it's resized to its healthy foundation. So then it becomes sustainable. And and a person can do that resizing on their own. Uh, they don't need the you know, approval or uh, cooperation of the other person. Yeah, I talk about concentric circles. Um, the, the people in my closest concentric circle uh, have it all. Yeah. They can go anywhere with me. And then I have friends, you know, I go to the movies with. They wouldn't know a feeling if it fell from the sky, but they're uh -huh. fun to be around. <laughs> uh, they're not my closest friends. They're further out. Yeah. But I, I treasure them for what they have. And that's my version of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like what is sort of a current underneath everything that we're talking about here is just trust, the notion of trust. Like, can I trust you inside of this relationship or not? One of the things that we were just talking about earlier in general is, okay, you've got somebody who's behaving a little bit better inside of a relationship. And uh, that person for the 10,000th time goes to their spouse with some loving correction of one kind or another. They feel like there's a major imbalance in between who's doing more, who's doing less, all of that good stuff. It takes a certain amount of gumption to go once more into the breach if you feel like you can't trust that the other person's going to be super responsive to your request. I'm sure that there are a lot of people listening right now who are like, yeah, this all sounds nice, but I don't know if I can really trust my partner. Um, and sometimes what walks into the office, a lot of the time what walks into the office, I would imagine, are relationships where there's been a major breach of trust um, of one form or the other. So maybe in you know, in the classic example, somebody's cheated on somebody else. Um, but often this takes a lot of smaller forms if somebody has just said 10,000 times, yeah, I'm going to correct this behavior, and they never do. Sometimes it's really authentic that somebody wants to change. And they come in, and they're like, I want to change, but trust has been broken in the past. How do you help people kind of repair that or reconcile that inside of a partnership, assuming that they want to stay in it? The issue isn't what's happened in the past. The issue is what's going to happen in the next five minutes. In terms of the therapist listening to this, uh, I believe that uh, we as a three-part, the three-person system have resources that you as a two-person system didn't have. And uh, uh, one of the things about relational life therapy, uh, which we're known for, is we're not neutral. We take sides. Well, we do. And we side with the disempowered one. Uh, we throw our weight behind empowering the disempowered one to stand up. And we as therapists have a, a hand to play in that. So uh, it's our job to help people have the courage to stand up for uh, what's right and help the, uh, the superior entitled grandiose one to come down and to teach the grandiose one that it's in your interest to come down from these privileges. And that takes some skill. You're not doing this to please your partner. Uh, you're doing this because it's in your interest to come down from that and be more relational. You can have your way uh, or you can have a happy marriage. Which would you prefer? Uh, so um, this is where... If someone's stuck in that disempowered position uh, and the other person just bullies them or stonewalls them or in some ways won't listen to them, that's a, that's a red flag that says you need help. And I got to say, many, many therapists will take the disempowered one and throw them right under the bus. Well, that's your opinion. And sir, what is your opinion? No, we we don't do that. You know what? You're getting a raw deal. What do you want to do about that? And uh, what are you going to do when he or she uh, stands up to you and does that? We accentuate uh, the negative consequences for the person in the superior position. It, it's uh, it, it goes back to motivation. Uh, I heard you speaking about that Rick, in a, in a talk you gave earlier. I was listening to it earlier today, that we therapists are motivators. You know, one of the things about grandiosity as opposed to shame, and as a field, we've done a terrible job of helping people come down from grandiosity, 
is grandiosity does not motivate you to get out of grandiosity. Grandiosity feels good. It feels good to get your way. It feels good to haul off and yell at somebody. It feels good to have an affair and cheat on somebody. That's why we do it. And you have to teach somebody that it's not in your best interest, uh, even though it may feel good in the moment. And that's our job as mentors and teachers and therapists to, uh, to sell that to them. Well, Terry, there is so much else that we could talk about here. In fact, I think you gave us just a wonderful jumping up point there into a whole other conversation <laughs> about uh, positive and negative grandiosity and uh, excelf- excessive self-flagellation as a form of grandiosity for some people, uh, the ways in which those power dynamics infect our relationships, just a whole other can of worms here. But I really love what we talked about here today, and I think that this was just so helpful for so many people. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us. I totally enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you both. And um, it's a great joy. I, I, I love this interview. I love this conversation with the two of you. And um, uh, I, I just want to tell you, I feel enormously respected and seen and appreciated by you both. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Terry. That honestly means a lot. That's really touching. Thank you. Yeah. Today, we had such a rich and deep conversation with Terry Reel, the author of the new book, Us, Getting Past You and Me to Build a More Loving Relationship, which comes out on June 7th. I began the conversation by asking Terry about his relationship with his father, a father that he described as violent and physically abusive. And he also detailed the ways in which, as a child, He was moved into a position inside of the family structure of needing to placate and accommodate and deal with, broadly speaking, his parents' maladaptive behavior from a very young age. And this story served as a foundation for so many of the themes that we talked about with Terry today. We talked about the way that patterns of behavior are passed down inside of our families, of patriarchal structures that influence the behavior of both men and women. We talked about toxic individualism and the myth of the individual that is held up in so much of Western culture as being above their environment, above their relationships. That if you are in relationship, you are fundamentally weak because you are dependent on others. You are not the master of your domain. And of course, all of these stories just aren't true. Yes, it's really important for us to claim our agency, our individual agency, and look for opportunities that we have in the world to affect things in more positive ways, to break out of the old patterns and structures of behavior that we have. But we're fundamentally dependent. As animals, we're dependent on the environment, inside of our relationships. If we're going to form a loving and collaborative relationship, we are absolutely dependent to a degree on our partners, We are us. That is the underlying fundamental framework. There is very little I that exists in functional relationships out in the world. This doesn't mean to not stand up for your own needs. Of course you should stand up for your own needs. But what it means is that the fundamental uh, metric of a relationship is its relationality. It's not about how much can you get from it. We used a lot of gendered language throughout the conversation, and I really want to emphasize at the end here that these were big, sweeping generalizations with a lot of room for individual variation, including the presence of people who do not identify with that traditional gender binary. But there is a common pattern that you see emerge in heterosexual relationships. And we talked about it during this conversation, the movement of men into outwardly strong, high-performing, and, well, individualistic, but then inwardly haunted and shaming, painfully aware of all of the things that they haven't accomplished in our accomplishment-obsessed culture. And then alongside that, traditionally the movement of women into outwardly accommodating, nice, polite, caring, loving, and then inwardly resentful because they are not given the space in the culture to express their own needs and claim their own power. This is what Terry described as America's power couple. They might be very successful out in the world, but man, does it lead to problems inside of our own relationships. And we talked for a while about what we can do about this, how we can undo our own patterning inside of our relationships, whether those patterns were passed down from our parents, 
or they were methods of adaptive coping that we learned when we were young, or if we get them from broader cultural stories about what it means to inhabit a certain kind of body. Terry emphasized that the patterns of behavior that we cultivate when we're young in order to survive make a lot of sense. Generally speaking, our defenses are there for reasons. The brain-body system is actually really, really good at helping us survive challenging circumstances. But those same behaviors that maybe were very useful back then tend to come with a lot of consequences these days. Those behaviors make up what Terry calls our adaptive child response, which he distinguishes from the wise adult. The wise adult exists in the here and now. The wounded child is perhaps the damage that was done to a person back then. And the adaptive child is what arose out of that wounding in order to survive. To share a little personal opinion here, I think that one of the most powerful practices that a person can take on is thanking their adaptive child. Really appreciating the ways in which their coping behavior arose from a unique set of circumstances and served very valuable purposes. And then often, once we've thanked that adaptive child, once we've appreciated the value of the responses that we learned, this funny thing can start to happen where this space opens up and this relaxation around that defensive patterning can start to take place. I found it immensely helpful personally. Terry talked also about moving away from a... Uh, a kind of legalese attempting to determine the exact objective reality of what happened with your partner, and moving toward more of a relational orientation, where the focus is not placed on what was objectively true. There can be a place for that for a minute or two, fact-finding can be important, but heavily emphasizing what was the other person's experience. This gets us away from a wide variety of conversations that are both fraught and challenging while also not being that helpful. The question is no longer, is what somebody did right or wrong? And instead becomes, how did my behavior impact the other person's experience? And there can be a place for both of these things. Speaking personally, I come from a background where I'm a real fact-finding kind of guy. I like to know what objective reality is, and I know that my own tendency is to get a bit bogged down in that, honestly, and to try to do maybe a little too much fact-finding about, okay, but what did the person actually say? When the truth is, I should be devoting the bulk of my attention to what was the other person's lived experience. So I can satisfy that impulse, I can begin in fact-finding, but I gotta have a timer running in my head where after 10, 15 seconds, I need to move into, hey, what's the relational orientation here? What is my partner looking for? What is, whether they're a conversational partner or they're a romantic partner, doesn't really matter, a friend. What is my partner looking for in this moment? And how can I give more of that to them? And that just moves us out of I and into that us framework very, very rapidly. We talked about a lot during this conversation. This was a long summary, and I covered maybe half or two-thirds of what we spent our time talking about today. Uh, Terry's work is fantastic. I strongly recommend it to just about anyone. His classic book, I Don't Want to Talk About It, is one of my most frequently recommended and gifted books, particularly to male friends. And I would imagine that us is probably going to be joining that. So if you'd like to learn more about Terry's book, I've included a number of links to it in the description of today's podcast. Also, if you've come this far and you are somehow not subscribed to the podcast, we'd really appreciate it. If you would take a moment to subscribe to it through the platform of your choice and maybe even leave a rating and a positive review, it really does help us out. Also, if you want to support the show in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash being well podcast and for the cost of just a couple dollars a month you can support the show and you'll receive a bunch of bonuses in return things like transcripts of our conversations ad free versions of the episodes and expanded notes these very detailed show notes that i put together for every conversation that we record that's it for today's episode until next time thanks for listening